Hi, everybody, and welcome to the portion of Itro. And we know that um, <clears throat> this parasha, uh, this section, is an unbelievable section. The reason it is unbelievable is because we're talking about Itro, Jetro, uh, not being involved in all the Israelite uh, movement from slavery to leadership, and still he come to share with them the gratitude that he has to the creator because of them. Meaning that he has so much appreciation and gratitude after what he saw that the Israelites went through in Egypt, the slave, the plagues, 10 plagues, the splitting of the Red Sea, unbelievable. Just come and appreciate it. So the question that all the commentary ask, and especially Rashi, Vaishmaitro, say Rashi, the commentary, Mashmu Hashama, what is that rumors that he heard that he came to the Israelite camp and to tell them how impressive he is? It say that he heard about the splitting of the Red Sea and the war with Amalek that the Israelite has last week. And the idea is that we need to ask, why did he hear and nobody else heard? And they say, the commentary say that everybody heard, but nobody came. So let's, let's define ourselves. For a second, what type of person we are? Are we the people who hear or we cannot hear the message? Are we are the one who absolutely hear the message or we cannot hear the message? Then we have another group. When we hear the message, are we the one who go and join that group or we just ignore and go back to our couch and doing basically nothing. How can we define ourselves by the story of Itro? And it's a very important that we understand who he was. Itro was a leadership. He was the leader of all leaders to idol worshiping. Kohen Hon. He was not just nobody. He was a priest that lead the concept called idol worshiping. And he was willing to leave all of it for the sake of seeking the truth and finding the truth. There is a big difference between people who are seeking the truth and finding the truth. Sometimes the seeker don't want to find anything. I know a guy who keeps looking for soulmate. I don't think that guy want to find a soulmate. He's kind of having a good time looking for them. So the question is, do we want stability in our life? Looking for the truth chasing the truth, understanding this is the truth, and understanding that I got to make a move to connect <clears throat> to what really is the truth. So if we're asking this question and we relate it to Moshe Rabbeinu and we relate it to Itro, we need to start asking ourselves, is there is a message that I'm skipping over? Is there is something that somebody tell me or there is something that somebody refused to tell me? Maybe they don't want to tell me because they're afraid I will get hurt. Another question, what's the real story behind it about you and me? You are in the desert. You're pretty famous. Your Facebook page is unbelievable. Your Instagram, everybody follow you. You're Itro. You're Jetro. You are the one and only. You are the priest that everybody come to ask questions. Would you go ahead and bother if you will find out that everything you did, maybe it's not true. Maybe it's not real. Would you be willing to leave all of that things behind you and say, I'm going to start from scratch? Do you have it in you? Do you have that DNA in you so you will be capable of living fake life, searching and finding a real life?
That's what Yitro represent, my friend. That's what Yitro represent. Many people here and do nothing. Many people here and do nothing. Many people hear and listen and do nothing. Because the normal tendency of humanity is not changing. Why? Rav Ashtag explained it in his book because the core of our soul, the essence of who we are comes from the Creator. The Creator doesn't have any movement. So a human being don't feel a need to move. Because the human being feel, if I have that spark within me, the creator, that there is no movement. Those of you who think there is speed of light, there is no speed of light. You cannot measure the speed of light because the light is never move. It's everywhere. We cannot just discover it in a scientific condition that we have or instrument that we have. But one day, when the instrument will get better, we will tap into a level that we will understand nothing ever move from the fulfillment point of view. But until we get there, we need to move. We need to change. We need to improve. We need to look for what's better. It all did that. Now, let me tell you what he lost. <sighs> when he made that such important decision, he has daughter. He only has daughters. Nobody won't marry his daughter, by the way. Because they say, we're not follow a guy that changed his mind about idol worshiping. What if he tried to tell them, hey, listen, I was following something false. I was following something fake. I, I, I was doing mistake and I make you follow me and follow whatever I thought to be right. I just discover. This is not real. Look what it says in the Pasuk. He heard what Elohim, God, did to Moses and to the Israelite. And he got them out of Egypt. Just to let you know what Egypt, Egypt is like a black hole. You can't get out of Egypt. You can't. I don't care how much pray and meditation. You cannot. We'll never get out of Egypt. If not, there is a stronger force than black hole get you out. And he's coming to see his son-in-law, Moses. Moses buried his daughter. And one is telling him, I am your father-in-law, Itro, come to see you with your wife and your two sons. Why do you have to say, I am your father-in-law, Itro? I am Itro, or I am your father-in-law? Rabbi Isaac Luria, right? Because Itro was the brother of Moses from another lifetime. Itro was Cain. Ani, Chotnecha, Itro, Aleph, Ched, Yud, Achi, Achi, Achi mean my brother. So it all was the brother of Moses from another lifetime. So here they finished the tikkun by Cain, killed him last lifetime because of additional twin that Evel has. Now Evel reincarnated into Moses, Abel. And now Moses is receiving a wife from Jethro, which is his daughter. Zipporah. They finish the circle. And he continue it all. And look what it say. Moses heard about it. They came out and he hugged. Just to let you know, when it say Moses came out, we talk about the leader of all spirituality at that point, Moshe Rabbeinu. The leader of all spirituality and the leader that everybody know in the world, not just in the camp of the Israelites, that God chose this man to lead the whole world for spirituality. Not just the Israelites, the whole world. And Jethro, Moses having a conversation, and he knew that nobody could get out of Egypt. And you guys left with 600,000 people. This is unbelievable, say it all. Unbelievable. So, this is a, a, a beginning of discussion. And Itro now saying, now I know that your God is the greater God of all time. And he joined them. He joined them. So, by joining them, he lose all the record that he accomplished for all his life, 
all the idea that is special, all the follower on Facebook and Instagram, everything that you can imagine that was working 3,500 years ago is gone, taken away. Would you do such a thing? Would you change the truth if you know that you put your life on the line, your family life on the line, your food, your house, would you still search for the truth? Would you still go for what you think it's the right thing? That's a question. Are you willing to go further with the truth when you know that the establishment that you established was based on foundation of lie, but you didn't know? But the day that you're going to know, would you leave? Would you leave a bad husband or a bad wife when you know they're not for you? Would you leave a bad job when you know in that job they're raping women and men and abusing people? Would you leave that place? Or you would stay there because your status is so high, how can you leave such a thing? Unfortunately, most people will stay. And that's why the world look the way it is. Doctors, nurses, some of them just make somebody else do the test for them. Now the COVID hit, they wake up to see, oh my God, what are we doing? Science, they have no idea what they're doing. But they're guessing, right? Among them, they all, always have one from 10,000 who know what he's doing, and the rest follow. You always see. I mean, you don't need, you, you're not stupid. You just open your eyes, look at the hospital, look at the uh, nurses, look at the TV when they, they show all this COVID situation. Huh? People just follow. They have no idea what's going on. No idea. Just no idea what's going on. But the one who knows what's going on, once you get to that position in a hospital, that position as a rabbi, that position as a priest, that position as something, would you leave if you know it's fake? Would you speak if you know it's wrong? One time, they asked me to join a group to speak bad about something. And I said, I don't want to do that. Say, so, Liao, but we know that you've been abused more than us. So, so I can write something, but I don't want to write it all the way. And they're saying, why? You are the man who seek the truth. You are the man who speak. And I said, I don't see the benefit of speaking bad about the other person. But I do see the purpose of doing good about what we can do about the world to make it a better place to be. And I, then I find out that uh, uh, Mother Teresa said the same thing. Show me a group that go forward with some idea and don't show me a group to speak bad about another person. Everybody can speak bad. What's the beautiful about it all? He found out that there is Moses. He didn't speak bad about those people who didn't follow him. He didn't care. He said, listen, that was my way. I choose it to be the wrong way now, and I'm choosing Moses' way. And that's what he did. By the way, from Jethro came a religion called the Druze. The Druze, that's how it's called, with D, the Druze. The Druze is a mystical religion, okay? There's majority in Syria and in Israel, northern part of Israel. The tradition say that Jethro is buried in the northern part of Israel, south of the Sea of Galilee. They've been being happy to be there. Connect, pray, respect the people with their religion. Very powerful place. Hopefully I will be able to take you there. But that's not the point. The point I'm trying to say can we ask this week for an awakening, for a small awakening, that I want to wake up? No coincidence that this week is also Mercury is in retrograde as of yesterday on Sunday. So it's going to be like that. So we can renew our relationship with ourselves and with others or our family. But we must, must, must. It's a necessity to search for the truth and be willing to lose whatever was fake. Think about it. If you don't let go of whatever was fake in your life, that fake thing will chase you and you don't want it to chase you. It is wrong and you gotta let it go. It will be painful. It's not gonna be easy. You will lose before you win. But if you're not ready really to lose something, then you're not truly ready to win, you know? You can't win before you lose the wrong thing you have in your life. There's a story I heard yesterday. In the community in Jerusalem, there is a community in Jerusalem that, you know, people, all what they do is 
study all day long from morning, from 6 a.m. till till sunset. That's all what they do. They study Torah, they study spirituality. And they're scholars, they, they, they know the whole, the whole Torah that God gave us on Mount Sinai, they know it all by heart. And they start studying when they are already six years old. This gentleman is about 17 years old. He's walking in Jerusalem. And you know, Jerusalem is divided to a few quarters. There's the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Armenian quarter, okay? You have, you have different, different quarters in Jerusalem. And, you know, because of the tension in Jerusalem, everybody claimed that's belonged to him. The Jewish people know not to walk in a Muslim neighborhood because sometimes there is fanatic who can do wrong thing. This gentleman, in the middle of his study, he needs something sweet. He can't help himself. She said to his friend, listen, listen, I'm going to take a break from the study for 20 minutes, bring something sweet and come back. Okay. He go. As he go, he see to the corner where the Jewish quarter meet the Muslim quarter, he saw this girl who was about 14 years old. He's being approached by a fanatic Muslim guy, very big, about 6'5". That's the way he described it. And he approached her in a way that he get her to a corner. That 14 years old doesn't know what she's doing. She's from panicking, start to go in the wrong direction. And he's happy about it. And he's happy. Now he's seeing it. He said, well, the Bible said that I have to save her. He go everything by the Bible. But I'm afraid because this guy is 6'5". He's about 300 pounds. What am I going to do? I mean, if I punch him, if I do something and... Uh, he had no idea what to do. So he starts screaming in a weird way around him. The person turned around while he's holding his hand on the girl. Turn around, say, get out of here. And the gentleman said, leave her alone. Say, I'm not gonna leave her alone. So he come closer to him, really to fight with him. And the guy took a knife. And at that time he released the girl, he took a knife and he, 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 he tried to stab him but he couldn't reach him, the, the kid was fast. But in the end, it was uh, unfortunately cut his face. And the blood started, the, 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 the Palestinian guy, the, the Muslim guy ran away. The girl ran away, started screaming, blah, blah, somebody injured. And they took him to the hospital, he lost a lot of blood. And his life continued. He went back to the school to study. By the age, usually 20, 21, those people who study Torah all their life, usually they get married. But unfortunately, when he's going to find a girl to get married, that scar is really, it's, it's an obvious scar. It really makes him look like an animal. So in his school, everybody got married by 21 to 23. They all got married. He's already 25. He gave up. I mean, he tried to go with so many girls to uh, what they call a date or matchmaker or something like that. And nobody's into it. He tried. So he's a rabbi, he's a rabbi come to him and said, what's going on? I said to him, listen, I, I, I try everything, but I don't know what to do. I mean, this is, uh, this is the way I am, you know, I have an ugly face now. And I think I did the right thing, saving the girl, but the face unfortunately changed. And that's what it is. And the rabbi, the rab, the rabbi looked at him and he said, are you ashamed of it? I said, yes, I am. He said, why are you ashamed of it? If, if that was a sign of saving a human being, a human life, you just save a person from a rape, from, from stabbing, from a lot of things. You should be proud of that scar. And he said, okay, I'm going to try to do the best. I said, you know what? Let me take you to the rabbi of Olo Rabbi. He lives in Bnebrak. I'm going to drive you there. I want you to come with me. He go, and he go to Rabbi Kanevsky, those of you who know the name. And he sit with him, and Rabbi Kanevsky say, what's the problem? He said, I'm not getting a girl. They don't like me usually when I'm going on a date. And he said to him, how did that happen? And he tell him, he tell him I said, girl, he said, when you start a date, you right away pointed to the scar? He said, no. When I go on a date, if we take a walk, I'm, I'm choose the side of the walk of the other chick, so they wouldn't see that scar. And on a date, I tried to sit in a certain way that they wouldn't see my face. So the rabbi, the, the head rabbi of the rabbi, tell him why.
So because I'm embarrassed. So you should not be embarrassed of something good you did. The first second that you sit on the chair, first thing you turn your face and you see this scar, this has happened to me because I tried to save a girl in Jerusalem. That's how you start. The guy is really nervous now. He's like, he suffered a little bit from insecurity to begin with, and now on top of it, he need to speak about it. He, he wasn't feeling comfortable, but he decided to do so. So he's going on a first date, and I see him on the first date, and he and he's he nervous because that's the first time he's going to talk about the scar. And this beautiful girl sitting, uh, those of you know how the matchmaking go. You go to the matchmaker, they get you to a hotel, you meet in the hotel, and you drink tea. And then you talk about if you're interested in each other, then you meet again. So they sit each other, and he, he gets himself strong enough, and he turns his face to her, and he says, I'm so sorry, but... You know, the, the, my rabbi, who was the head of the rabbi, they all told me to start with that. That's why I'm doing it. But I know it's a little bit embarrassed, but I have to tell you about my scar. He said, that's how you want to start? I said, yes, that's how I want to start. He said, you see this scar? I know it makes my face look a little off. But I want you to know it happened because it was a girl. She was young, many years ago. I'm, I was 17. Now I'm 25. We talk about, like, what is it, eight years ago. And... Um, uh, that's what happened. I saved her, I tried to save her, but I'm not good with martial art or punching or anything like that. Uh, uh, I couldn't say, I mean, he let her go and then the guy cut me and that's what happened. And he said, look at the girl, and she says, she's crying. I said, whoa, I listened to the rabbi, what he told me to do, and now I make a girl cry. That's even worse than the other one. The other one at least left smile. She's crying. And she looked at him and she said to him, you know how old I am? She said, he said no, I didn't, I didn't ask for her. She said, I'm about 22. And I was that girl. I was that girl that you saved. When I'm trying to tell you this story, my friend, you never know. You never know when you do something right. You never know how things are going to turn around. So stop looking for a word and how great it is and the sign and what's the sign of the zodiac. Do good. Do good. Do be like Itro. You do good. And when you do good, good will find you. I know that you have to lose your status of before. I know that it's painful. I know that you belong to some church or synagogue or places or country or state or city or some belonging to some community. Let me tell you something. When it's time to leave, you gotta leave. Because if you stay, you are giving fuel to something fake. If you're asking me, if you're asking David, we were part of something for almost 30 years. When it was time to leave, it was time to leave. I wasn't a nobody there. In my previous job, I was the writer. I was the one who made decisions for many, many people. Until I thought, this is not serving the people. That's serving other God, idol worshiping. It's time to move on. Did I took my status with me? No. Did I took my fame with me? No. I had to start from scratch all over again. And I'm not here to tell you I'm at all. I'm not here to tell you I'm better or worse or the same. I'm here just to motivate you if, if there is such a thing. That if you want a real change in your life, you have to be, make a move. And in that move, you're going to lose a lot of things. Are you willing to lose the past for finding the future? Are you willing to let go of the marriage that you are in to find the real marriage? Are you willing to let go of the comfortable girlfriend, boyfriend to find the real soulmate? Are you willing to let go of a bad job to find a good job? It's all waiting for you. But remember, 
the lost part, the losing part, would be you have to understand that, that you lose your status. Because if your status is still there, that means that you never move. That's what it throws is so important. For that reason, can you imagine, what's the name of the portion this week? It throws after him. There is no portion named Moses, but there is a portion named Ito. Why? Because that man, Ito, make a move. Nobody asked him to do it, by the way. It's not that God revealed to him and said to him, do, do this, do that. No. I'm leaving. That's what makes Ito, whoever it is. And for that reason, eventually Ito become a reincarnation of the greatest rabbi named Rabbi Akiva. Now you know. And after that, become Rabbi Chaim Vital. It's not just somebody. You need to know a change that you make ooh, lasts forever. Don't be ever worry about your status. Because if you worry about a status, you will never live. Some of us are king and queen of fake things. If you left that fake thing, you're no longer kings and queen. Because think about it. From the beginning, you were never king and queen. But we want to hold on to that like monkey or the banana without letting go. Okay, let it go. Okay? Second section is the meeting between Ito to Moses in the next morning. Ito watching his son-in-law, Moses, working too hard. And Ito basically advised Moses, and I think I mentioned that last year. Why would Etro, why would be Etro advising Moses? And Rashi write, Madua ta yoshev levadecha v'kulam nitzavim. Etro said, why are you sitting and everybody's standing? Moses didn't take it as you're working too hard about Moses. He took it like, maybe I have ego and I should not judge the people if I have ego because I'm sitting and they're standing. And then later on, he tried to make it clear and said to him, no, it's not what I meant that you have ego, God forbid. You are, you are half angel, you are almost an angel. It's the point is that if you want to do the best that you can do for those people, maybe we should divide the responsibility you got to learn to divide responsibility. You got to learn to give people their power so you will be able to do less or more, actually, but the people will benefit more. And that's another question we have to ask ourselves. Delegate. Does that mean it's good for you or it's good for the people? Both. A lot of time people don't want to do things which are good for them because they think it's selfish. But if it's in the end of the day, it's better for the people, then do it for you. You have to learn those methods of sharing the responsibility. But Moses asked Jethro a very good question. How do I know who to choose to be the right person to judge the people? And he told them, and he told them, you shall see with your Ruach HaKodesh, with your uh, uh, Holy Spirit or Divine Spirit of Moses, you would know who is the right people. You will see, you will choose among them rich people. First the rich people, because nobody can buy them with money, bribe them. Then you will choose uh, people of truth. It's people that never lie. Then you will choose other group of people the people who don't take their money so seriously. And then you divide those leaders above the nation of Israel. And through that, you can lead the, the Israelite. The Zohar Itro, in Zohar Hadash and the regular Zohar, explained that Moses was able to read their face and their palm, and through that, he gave them the responsibility. But in the Zohar of Rabbi Moshe Kodavero, written, those of you who study for me the palm and face reading, you know, I hope I say it there. If I didn't, I say it now. Remember, that 
knowledge, this knowledge was given to Moses, not to all human beings. And because it was giving to Moses, it was giving Moses the chance to choose the right people, to lead the people in the best way that they can. And that's, by itself, is a tremendous, tremendous, of a tremendous, tremendous idea. Are you open, like Moses, even if you are a leader, to get advice from other people? If the goal is for humanity, if the goal is the universe, then of course it would be very easy to listen. But if the goal is you, then you will have all kind of argument of how to listen. Now, palm and face reading, it's a beautiful knowledge. I mean, on your face, you have many areas, the forehead, the eyebrow, the eyelash of the eye, the color of the eye, the pupil, size of the pupil, the ears, the earlobe, the nose, shape of the nose, going up, going down, lips, upper lips, lower lips, gum, teeth, thumb, index finger, middle finger, ring finger, pinky finger, size between the measure of the finger, the nail, the line, everything is means something. Moses, because he has Ruach HaKodesh, he has the Holy Spirit, didn't need to learn palm and face. He was just knew what's right, what's wrong. It was pure, no agenda. And that's how he start to choose the right people to guide the people of basically the, the Israelite. And, uh, and Moses took that advice and started implementing it. And, uh, 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 and at that point, after Jethro shared with him, he left him. He left him. He left uh, 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 to convert his own family. He went back after he met Moses to convert his own family. And of course, he left uh, um, uh, um, uh, the wife, Zipporah, Moses' wife, and the kids with him. Then he went back to his home to convert everybody to follow that new religion. At that time, it was new religion, Judaism, the Israelite, the Hebrew slave who turned to be Jewish, because Judaism was not exist. It was only Hebrew people. So the Hebrew people chose a religion called Judaism after the name of Judah. So that, he went to convert himself, say, I want to be belong to that group of people. Even, you don't get a lot of benefit, but I want to follow the truth. Right after he leave, there is the last subject that we're going to talk about, is the gift of the Torah. The gift of the Torah. We need to understand, what is it, the gift of the Torah? Basically, try to imagine that I'm giving you a chip, a condensed chip, that have all the spiritual knowledge that ever will be exist in the world from beginning of time to the end of time, it will be written in a chip and I'm going to give it to you. That's what the Torah is. Where is it given? On Mount Sinai. What's the name of Mount Sinai? Ar Chorev. Chorev meaning destruction, the mountain of destruction. Teaching us the commentary, the Ari, the Zohar, Rabbi Shimshon, Astrapoli. And the reason it's called Ar Chorev, to teach you that spirituality has to be practiced even if you feel being destroyed. Whatever you don't feel so well, whatever money is not there, whatever things not working well for you, Torah continue. One thing that continue never stop is the Torah. That's Ar Chorev. Even, even things don't work in Ar Chorev, the mountain of destruction, or the Mount Sinai. By the way, the mountain of Sinai was not the big mountain, it was small. To teach you that spirituality is not about how great you become, is how small you become while you study. That's a real test of spirituality. Now, what exactly happened? In the first day of the month of Sivan, okay, they arrived to, on the Rosh Chodesh Sivan, they arrived to Mount Sinai. They parked there, they camped there, and Moses went to God. He was afraid. You need to know that. Moses went to God. And it was Arafel. It was foggy. It was cloud. That was the Shekhinah. And Moses couldn't get in. It was a mountain. He couldn't get in. It's scary. He's still a human being. Don't forget, Moses is a human being. That's what makes it so beautiful. And it said that Michael and Gabriel, together, holding by two hands, 
and push him toward the cloud, toward the Shekhinah, toward the fog, so he can do his job. Such a humble man. So the giving of the Torah, or the giving of the, uh, the whole idea, why did he have to wait till now? Abraham was a great man. He could do it then. Isaac, ooh. Jacob, Joseph. What's the story? The idea is that Rav Ashlag bring it, that it was never a time when you have a nation that are 600,000 people, that God can actually tell them one of the first things I want you to learn to do is to love each other. You cannot practice love each other when you're a small group, when you're one or two. I mean, you can practice, but it's too small. One of the things that God teach them on Mount Sinai is called Arvut. Arvut meaning that we are responsible for one another. If your brother is doing something wrong, it's your responsibility to do. Your sister, your responsibility to do. Your father, your responsibility to do. So before they receive the Torah, the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments. God is teaching them how to behave. For that reason, it was needed a nation to, to get out and to become a real nation. Why Ten Commandments? Well, the Ten Commandments is corresponding to something in Kabbalah called Ten Sefirot. And every Sefirah is corresponding to an energy. What's the first thing that you say? Anochi Hashem, I am God. What does that even mean? Well, when you said Anochi, you get kiseh. Anochi in kiseh. Kiseh means chair or a throne. So the, the energy came from the throne. We know that all the Ten Commandments came from the throne of the Creator. If it's not something physical, but just try to imagine it, but then that's not what it is. The Zohar said that kiseh, or, or the I am God, the first Dibra, also stand for the idea of shamor v'zachor. What is the first ten, uh, two commandments from the Ten Commandments? I am God. You should not have another God. And those two basically came in one voice. The, 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 the Torah said that people could see that voice. No, they didn't take mushroom. They could see the voice. It was voices that going around. The vibration, they could see it. Because the five senses were not limited anymore. They reach a level of what we call immortality. What is immortality? When the body is no longer control the soul. The body is no longer addicted. They achieve that arena, that level. And because they achieved that level, they were able, they were able to hear voices, but also to see the voice. The five senses were becoming one. The experience becoming one. Can you imagine? So there is two things in spirituality that came in one voice. I am God, and you should not have another God. I am God is what you should be doing spiritually. You should not have other God. You should not have idol worshiping. Mean what you shouldn't be doing in life of a spiritual person. You have to check those two things all the time. One, am I doing the right thing? And am I doing it with love and excitement? Second, am I preventing myself from doing the negative thing and I'm holding on strong enough not to do the wrong thing. Because after all, you have to ask yourself, if God would not tell you to steal, will you steal? If God will not tell you to kill, will you kill? And if God said, is that prevent the thief to steal and the killer to kill? So it's not about that, my friend. There is so much more into it. It's the idea of understanding that in life you have plus and minus. The minus, prevent yourself from doing the wrong thing. The plus, get excited when you do the right thing. I meet sometimes people who are full of spirituality. And they're only talking about what they do. It's not enough to come up with your own idea of what's right and wrong. 
And I'm so disappointed all the vegan eater and yoga master. It's good. You do that. Keep doing it. It's good. But don't replace it with the Torah that was given on Mount Sinai. 600,000 slaves left the evil Egypt, evil Pharaoh, and were able to become a nation of understanding positive and negative. Now that's, my friend, an achievement. And if you want to achieve something like that, you should follow it, not try to create something new. That's what this week, Parsha, is all about. I hope you got something out of this lecture. But I really hope more that you sit with yourself after this lecture, take a pencil, pen, piece of paper, and write. Don't, don't do it with your computer, please. Because then you get distracted with the Facebook and Instagram. That's a piece of paper. And write down, what am I willing to do with my life? Am I ready to make the jump? Or everything going to go back to the way it was? If you're ready to make the jump, we are here for you. We will guide you. And we'll do the best we can to ease your pain. Thank you. And have a wonderful, wonderful day.